Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. Back with another case study today, and we're going to take a look at one of the more interesting tornado events of the past few decades, and that is the Central Texas tornado outbreak from May 27, 1997, that included the infamous Gerald Texas F5 that you see on the screen here. If you were to look up the term mesoscale accident in the dictionary, you'd probably see a picture of the Gerald tornado. This was not forecast to be a significant tornado event at all, but some factors came together that turn this from a kind of run-of-the-mill sort of damaging wind and large hail event to one of the more notable tornado outbreaks in recent memory. So being that this was one of the more interesting case studies I've ever analyzed, uh, I wanted to share my findings with you all. Of course, we'll, in this video, dive deeply into the meteorology behind the event and then take a look at some of the factors that made this event so unique and turn this from a non-tornadic event to a violent tornado-producing event. So let's go ahead and get started here. Before we dive into the meteorology, I want to bring your attention to the plethora of resources that exist on the Gerald Tornado event, uh, including journal articles, websites from the National Weather Service offices involved, uh, etc. And I'll be referencing quite a few of these articles in this um, video, particularly these two by Houston and Wilhelmson uh, from back in 2007. They really dive deeply into the uh, environment and the progression of the event overall in these two articles, uh, part one and part two here. So if you hear me mention Houston and Wilhelmson, uh, 2007, I'll be referring to these papers. And of course, I'll put the links to all of these articles in the description box below so you can do some further research uh, yourself. So let's go ahead and get started here. Let's give you guys some context on the overall event. This was the map of all the tornadoes in the Dallas-Fort Worth and Austin-San Antonio weather forecast uh, areas, uh, areas on the 27th of May 1997. There were about 20 tornadoes here starting all the way up near the Waco area, uh, moving kind of down the I-35 corridor to the Austin-San Antonio area. So a very significant uh, event um, and it was forecast to be a pretty significant severe weather day, a moderate risk. This was the initial SBC outlook uh, from May 27th, 97. There was a moderate risk basically stretching from Austin up the I-35 corridor just to south of the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area and then areas out to the east towards Shreveport and F Fort Polk, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, but the SPC was not calling for a significant tornado event. They were expecting that the significant instability, of course, we're going to take a look at that in a second, the significant instability in place alone would allow for a severe thunderstorm threat with damaging winds and large hail and perhaps an isolated tornado or two along any surface boundaries that existed. And, and again, we're going to go through the surface uh, the interesting surface features here for this event in a second. But let's go ahead and start off with our kind of upper air map uh, discussion here. And just a note before we go into this uh, discussion, the um, archives, the data archives I use, don't really do a great job of going back as far as this event. Uh, so you're going to kind of see a piecemeal of different sources here for our weather data. But nonetheless, we're going to have some good weather data to discuss in this video. We're, we'll start off here on May 26th. There was actually a moderate risk out here. And several severe thunderstorms actually formed out across eastern Oklahoma and um, merged into an MCS that moved across Arkansas into the southeast into the morning hours on the 27th. But you can see starting on the morning of the 26th, we have a very uh, well developed trough here, nice belt of enhanced flow rounding the base of that trough, fairly zonal flow out here across the southern plains. And as we go through with time here, you can see it, that this kind of trough just meanders here underneath this very broad ridge here that extends all the way up into northern Canada here. So kind of this trough just meanders here, and we'll go into the 27th. This was the morning of the 27th. And you can see that the overall uh, sort of synoptic scale trough and synoptic scale forcing is fairly weak down here in Texas. We have just kind of, you know, extending from anywhere from 5 to, to 10 or 15 knots here down in South Texas to maybe 30 to 40 knots here across the Red River vicinity in uh, southern Oklahoma, northern Texas here. So the overall forcing was kind of removed from this region and the overall winds aloft were very, very weak. Uh, which is you know, quite unusual for a typical severe weather event. Just a quick note here at, at 250 millibars, we'll go up, kind of look for the, our difluence aloft. Again, the spreading apart of those wind vectors in the upper levels of the atmosphere that helps produce rising motion uh, in, this, in the sort of large scale. And we don't see a whole lot of that here across central Texas. We do have a little bit of a kink in the uh, geopotential height contour here, and maybe a little bit of defluence aloft here. You can see the wind barbs, 
kind of out of the, the sort of west-southwest here and kind of more sort of westerly or west-northwesterly here across south Texas. So maybe a little bit of defluence aloft here across central Texas, but overall, not what we typically see with a, a more significant severe weather event sort of in the exit region of the trough, as you see up here, kind of in the northern plains, Great Lakes vicinity here, some pretty strong defluence aloft there in the exit region of the trough. But down here in central Texas, we we're kind of well removed from the exit region of that trough. And we have just kind of broad sort of westerly to south, south southwesterly flow across the region. And so the overall sort of deep layer shear and overall forcing for ascent in the synoptic scale was, was quite weak. And um, so if we go down to 850 millibars here, let's go and take a look at our low level jet. And because we were kind of seeing fairly weak flow across the region, we didn't have a very well-defined sort of low-level jet and kind of low-level cyclone that we often see here out on the east side of the Rockies. Of course, we've talked about this in, in several forecast discussions and case studies before. When you have a big old trough at, in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere, kind of that west-southwesterly flow, that strong flow traversing the Rockies, you will get surface load development on the lee side or east side of the Rockies. And when that happens, you get the winds kind of in the warm sector to kind of uh, strengthen and back out of the south or southeast and really pump that moisture northward. And as a result of the mass response, you get a very strong kind of uh, deep layer shear environment favorable for severe weather. Well, that was not the case here at all. We would had a, that trough at 500 millibars kind of just meandering along and, and our overall surface low that had developed initially uh, from the uh, the trough traveling over the Rockies there had moved off toward the east. So here in Texas, we were seeing very quiescent uh, flow here in the low levels of the atmosphere. Again, not something we often see in typical severe weather events. You can see there at 850 millibars, the winds here were kind of very variable um, from north Texas to the north of the cold front we'll talk about in a second, kind of at sort of 10 to 15 knots out of the northeast. Uh, to the south of that, low-level winds here at about a kilometer off uh, above the surface, you know, 10 or 15 knots out of the south. So very, very weak flow in the low levels of the atmosphere. And that would create a very sort of um, unfavorable environment uh, for, compared to what we typically see for severe thunderstorms. If we look at our wind profilers here, this is the wind profilers from the uh, Nexrad radars here. This one particular one is at Austin, San Antonio, KEWX. And we'll go to sort of about 18Z here. And you can see not a whole lot going on throughout the atmosphere. Very weak flow all the way up through the entire atmosphere. Only 10 to 15 knots here, even above about 10 kilometers or so in the atmosphere. So the winds aloft were very, very weak and kind of chaotic here. We move on a little bit with time toward about 20Z. And the same thing. You can see very sort of um, consistent 10 to 15 knots of flow here from the surface all the way up through the entire atmosphere. So this was a very um, unusual profile for severe thunderstorms. Uh, and so let's now go to the surface. This is going to be our most important level that we'll, we'll take a look at here. And this is kind of what um, fueled this event um, for the most part. It took it from a kind of you know non-severe sort of you know garden shower variety thunderstorm event to a significant severe weather event. So very complex. Um, sort of surface pattern here. And, and this is from a paper written by Steve Corfiti, a former SPC forecaster that really dug deep into the um, Gerald event. And of course, I always like to kind of do, um, you know, unanalyzed surface maps so we can kind of go through that together. But of, uh, as, as we said before, the archive for data doesn't really go back that far and is very spotty. So this is going to be the best source we're going to be able to use, but we'll kind of go through what he's analyzed here uh, um, in this uh, portion of the video. So starting out here, we can see a cold front analyzed here from the Red River region down stretching toward the southwest here into the uh, Texas, uh, sort of the I-10 corridor down there. You can see the wind shift here. Winds very quiet, sort of five to 10 knots here out of the north or north northwest to the north of the front. Um, and switching toward kind of northwesterly to now southerly or southeasterly flow to the south of that front. So a very, a very well-defined frontal zone. You can see the temperature gradient as well. 69, 63 here, surface temperatures to the north of the front, 70s, upper 70s here um, to the south of the front. So cold front situated there. We also had a dry line that was situated just to the south of the cold front. 
And that was uh, kind of hard to determine from the actual surface data here. We do see quite a bit more moist air to the south of the front, dew points in the low to mid and even upper 70s here, just to the south and east of that dry line, whereas dew points back here to the north of the boundary in the 50s and the 60s. But the dry line was much easier to pick out on our satellite view here. So let's take a look at that. And so our cold front was back in here somewhere. Again, you can't really see it on the satellite view, but it was just off toward the east, or the west, excuse me, of the dry line. But you can really see the dry line here as this kind of fine line that separates kind of clear skies to the north from the bubbly sort of cumulus clouds just to the south and east of that boundary. So the dry line was much more easily um, analyzed here on the satellite imagery. And one thing we can also take a look at on the satellite imagery is what we call a gravity wave. Take a look right in here at kind of how the um, sort of a, a ripple in the clouds you'll see, kind of a change in the cloud characteristics as we go on with time. So you can kind of you know make it out as kind of right in this vicinity right here. Take a look at how just, there's just a slight difference in the clouds as it kind of moves as we move off toward in time here. And this gravity wave was a result of the overnight MCS that resulted from those eastern Oklahoma storms uh, and moved in, uh, into the Arkansas vicinity and into the southeast on the morning of the 27th. So we'll start here on the evening of the 26th. Keep an eye out here in eastern Oklahoma. You can see that kind of broad complex of storms fire up and move off toward the east. And this created what we call gravity waves. And I want you to think of a gravity wave as basically just a ripple in a pond. If you've ever thrown a rock into a pool or a, a pond or some body of water, you'll know that it goes in and creates a little bit of a splash, and then you get ripples that you know emanate out from where that rock um, went into the water. And that's the exact same process that happens here in the atmosphere that causes gravity waves. Think of the atmosphere as a fluid, and you have a, a, a st strong thunderstorm kind of go up in that fluid. It'll draw a really bad thunderstorm here just for um, this diagram's sake. But you have this kind of thunderstorm and think of that as the rock. That rock is interrupting that fluid and as you, at the fluid that is the atmosphere, and as that thunderstorm, that powerful thunderstorm goes up and that complex um, started to organize, you had these kind of ripples of energy that kind of emanate out from that thunderstorm in the atmosphere. And you know, you can kind of also think of it as sort of an outflow boundary without sort of the actual surface boundary. It's just kind of waves of energy in the atmosphere that emanate from a complex of storms, a very potent complex of storms, that kind of just go through the atmosphere. And they can cause localized areas of lift when they pass through a certain region. And that's kind of what we had here um, on the Gerald Day. So if we go through with time once again, you can kind of see that sort of... Um, gravity wave, if I go through pretty quickly here with time, you can see those kind of changes in the clouds here um, as you go on with time. There are kind of multiple sort of portions of this gravity wave, but the main one was right in there where that pink line was. And if we go through with time here, you can see that as that gravity wave passes through, we start to get storm initiation here on the surface cold front and dry line uh, sort of features here up in the vicinity of Waco, Texas. So it was, you know, has been posited that the gravity wave actually helped initiate the storms and may have actually helped the severity of the storms, although I don't think that was the case. But I do think that gravity wave, as it passed through, helped to initiate those storms out there in uh, kind of northeast Texas there. And you can see here by the time we get, by the time the event was well underway here, that gravity wave was well off to the south. And so it likely did not have an impact in the overall severity of the storms here in central Texas, but it, it did help initiate storms there along the cold front there near the Waco vicinity as it passed through. So very complex pattern, very complex sort of surface pattern here. Let's go back in time with our surface pattern here. You can also see one more thing. We have a kind of a dry line low as it has been turned by Corfidi here in his paper. Again, I'll, I'll put a link to that paper in the description as well. We kind of had a little circulation here develop along the dry line, and that would move off toward the south along the dry line boundary as we went on in the morning and afternoon hours. So you can see here with time, we go on, and that cold front starts to overtake that dry line by early afternoon. We really don't have as much space between that cold front and the dry line, and we kind of have what we call a zippered zippering effect, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but we have that dry line low kind of moving down along the dry line and that cold front overtaking the dry line. This um, solid wiggly line here is the gravity wave. 
And so as it passed through, as we kind of got that gravity wave to pass through that um, kind of dry line low, we started to see surface load development, uh, uh, storm development right on that surface low there on the dry line, kind of at that cold front dry line intersection as that gravity wave passed through. So by 18Z, storms started to get going there in the vicinity of Waco, and this would be our main sort of area of storms to watch throughout the afternoon. So we go to our radar here, and so we got initial development here just uh, kind of before, uh, kind of around noon here off well to the north. You can see these storms initially starting to move off toward the east, and then we start to see storms really intensify there about 18Z. And that was when the event was fully underway. But again, this was not expected to be a significantly, you know, sort of tornadic event. So let's take a look at some soundings and kind of see the overall environment um, and see why that was the case. And this was the Fort Worth 12Z sounding from May 27th, 1997. This was the observed sounding. A couple things we can notice right away. We have a moist layer here standing up from the surface, but it's not all that deep. The moisture is not all that deep here at the surface. It only extends up to about 900 millibars. So even though the actual dew point here at the surface was fairly high, 73 degrees there at Dallas-Fort Worth in the morning, it was the moist layer was not all that deep. It was kind of stuck beneath this very strong elevated mix layer here uh, that was actually very deep. And we talk about the elevated mix layer here over and over again on the channel. That elevated mix layer is that layer of, of um, sort of warmer, drier air and steeper lapse rates that emanates from areas out to the west or southwest, kind of, you know, western Mexico, the desert southwest, west Texas, on the higher terrain, and gets transported off to the east with time on that kind of westerly or southwesterly mid and upper level flow. And that's what helps kind of cap the atmosphere um, on severe weather days. Um, and it also helps to increase instability. And we can see exactly where this elevated mix layer came from. If we go back to the night before, 0Z on the 27th, so um, 7 p.m. on May 26th, and we go to El Paso here, you can see that layer, that ste very steep, very deep mix layer there at El Paso. We go to Midland as well, much of the same thing there. Very steep lapse rates, very well-mixed, uh, warm, dry air there extending from the surface upward a few kilometers there in the atmosphere. That, has, that is what had gotten transported across the region, and that is why the atmosphere was quite capped here. But there was already quite a bit of instability here in the morning of the 27th. And another reason was that we'd had um, some, of course, severe weather the past few days, but the central Texas area had remained capped. This had kind of been the story the last few days, well-mixed boundary layer here out to the west. That strong trough that we saw at 500 millibars had helped bring that out off toward the east. And this cap had just kind of been sitting here over central and south central Texas throughout the past, uh, the previous few days from the 27th. So there hadn't been any thunderstorm activity in central Texas for the past few days. So this atmosphere was kind of just primed for some strong storms here. You just needed some sort of um, initiation mechanism. And that was what we saw at the surface, our dry line and cold front, our gravity wave as well. That was what was going to help initiate storms here in this environment. But you can see, even though we had quite a bit of instability, which, of course, favorable for perhaps large hail and damaging winds with these storms, the overall wind profile was quite weak. You can see here just very chaotic, weak flow here in the kind of low to mid-levels of the atmosphere. Our hodograph, not very long at all. We do have bulk shear above 40 knots. That would actually decrease throughout the day as that kind of belt of flow at 500 millibars sort of uh, decreased with uh, in intensity and kind of uh, lifted away from the region. If we go back to 500 millibars here, we'll kind of go back to the morning hours. So you can see that belt of kind of 30 to 40 knots of flow. With time, that kind of it kind of sits there, kind of decreases though in intensity as we went through the afternoon hours. So the farther south you went into Texas, the weaker the flow was aloft. So, and the weaker, as a result, the deep layer shear was aloft across that region. So. Even though we had very strong instability already in the morning hours of the 27th, the overall wind shear profile was not really that favorable for significant tornadic thunderstorms. We go down here to the south to Corpus Christi, much of the same. Again, moisture, surface moisture a little bit stronger here, 76 dew point, but a very shallow moist layer there beneath that elevated mix layer aloft. Del Rio, Texas, much of the same, very strong instability already. And this is at 12Z, we're already seeing mix layer cape approaching 6,000 joules per kilogram. That is almost unheard of um, for a, you know, pretty even a typical severe weather event in the morning hours. 
So instability was building very rapidly because of that kind of untapped atmosphere, that very steep elevated mix layer there, very deep elevated mix layer as well, uh, atop that kind of shallow moist layer near the surface. But again, wind shear was not all that favorable for supercells. So we go here to, this is at 1945Z. This was a field sounding, an observed sounding that was taken by the Texacal experiment, the Texas, Texas A&M uh, Convection and Lightning ex Experiment. This was taken from Houston and Wilhelmson, part one uh, of their 2007 series of articles here. So on the left here, we have our sounding from Calvert, Texas. And just to give you a context of where Calvert is, here's Gerald over here, and about 56 miles off toward the northeast, uh, east northeast is the town of Calvert, Texas. So this was a fairly good proximity sounding just off toward the east. So again, this was at 1945 Z, just before 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time. A couple things uh, to note here. This portion on each of these soundings below this top dashed line here is the actual observed sounding from the field that they took near Calvert. But it was not a complete sounding. The balloon must have popped or something as it went up in the atmosphere. So above this dashed line, is a ruck is the ruck model profile from Temple, Texas, at 21Z. So it's kind of a composite sounding between the actual observed data here below the dashed line, and a ruck model sounding that kind of filled the missing data void up there aloft above about 500 millibars here. So on this sounding to the left, this was with unmodified surface temperature. So the actual surface temperature here at 18Z at Calvert, Texas. Uh, that resulted in a Cape value, an instability value of almost 5,000 joules per kilogram with a mixed layer sin of about minus 40 joules per kilogram. So sin, convective inhibition was rapidly eroding in a very unstable profile. Now, if we modify our surface temperatures for what the observed surface temperature and dew point were at Temple, Texas at 21Z, we get this sounding here on the right. So this was a modified sort of boundary layer, modified surface conditions here for this sounding on the left. And what we got here, a, which would be more representative of the actual environment as, these, uh, as the event was ongoing, is a Cape value here of 6544 joules per kilogram. So that's what we consider extreme instability. Even on our most notable severe weather events, we don't often see instability this high. Now, it's not that uncommon to see the instability values this high in the late spring and summer months down in south central Texas. But again, this is extreme instability and would lead to explosive thunderstorm development given an initiation mechanism, which is what we had from our surface boundaries, our gravity wave, etc. here. So that elevated mixed layer aloft and the very steep lapse rates aloft, that surface heating as well, and the fact that we had been kind of left with an untapped atmosphere the last few days leading up to the May, uh, May 27th event had led to this very extreme instability here in central to south central Texas. Now here is an ADA model sounding from 18Z at Temple, Texas on May 27th. So this was a model sounding. We you know today would look at kind of a RAP model sounding in proximity to a given um, storm. This was the ADA model analysis and this was from a John Davies paper on uh, supercells, significant tornadoes in weak shear environments. And I'll post a link to that in the description as well. So this was a model sounding in the vicinity of Temple, Texas on May 27th at 18Z. And you can see once again, very, very strong instability. The shaded red um, area is that area between the temperature curve of the sounding in the atmosphere and our parcel trace that this yellow line here as you go up in the atmosphere. So very strong instability, surface-based cape approaching almost 7,000 joules per kilogram here. That is just off the charts for instability. But you need instability and wind shear for severe storms. And we only had zero to six kilometer shear of 25 knots. And you can see on the wind profile here at the right, just very weak, chaotic winds here throughout the atmosphere. In the low levels, five to 10 knot winds up to about 700 millibars with 500 millibar flow only at about 25 knots. And again, throughout the day, that belt of flow rounding the base of our kind of central plains trough here was um, would kind of just sit there and at least kind of decrease with time as well. So we go, we start here in the morning hours, you see that kind of belt of flow, 40, 30 to 40, 45 knots here up into the Red River vicinity in Oklahoma, there in North Texas as well. We go on with time, that kind of, we kind of lose that strong, sort of stronger sort of flow with time and, and to, with Southern extent, of course, the we are farther removed from the, the kind of enhanced belt of flow here. So with Southern extent, you can see upper level winds 10 to 15 knots at most. So very, very weak flow 
So as a result, this was not expected to be a tornadic event. We had very strong instability, which is favorable for explosive thunderstorm development with a triggering mechanism, the cold front, dry line, gravity wave, etc. But large hail damaging winds at most was going to be the main threat with, with shear in the 25 knot range. Usually for supercells, we like to see that 30, 35 plus knots of bulk shear there for a sustained supercell development. We only see, we're only seeing in this model sounding about 25 knots of bulk shear there. So overall, the environment was not very favorable for tornadic supercells, at least sustained supercells in general. So that begs the question, how did we get sustained tornadic supercells out of this event? Well, the rotation in these supercells has to come from somewhere. If it's not going to come from the ambient environment, it has to come from some other source. Well, our surface boundaries are what helped feed these storms their rotation. So we had these storms fire up along the cold front as that gravity wave passed through. Along the cold front slash dry, dry line intersection there, we had storms develop. Now, when you have these, these boundaries, we see you often have a very strong sort of wind shift along that boundary. You can see winds to the north out of the... Uh, to the north of the cold front, out of the north or northwest, winds to the south, out of the south or south-southeast there. So very strong convergence, very strong kind of shear across the boundary there. So lots of horizontal vorticity along this boundary. When you have very strong horizontal vorticity or spin along the boundary, and you have instability like this, especially in the low levels here, we go back to our temple ADA model sounding here, zero to three kilometer cape of 319 joules per kilogram. I've, I've honestly never seen a a value of zero to three kilometer cape that high. But, so when you have low level instability that strong and you have spin near the surface along that boundary, that spin is going to be tilted and stretched into the vertical. And that is how the storms that formed along the boundary were able to attain supercell characteristics and their you know inherent rotation. They were able to stretch that vorticity into the vertical and help, uh, and that would help them start to rotate pretty efficiently. So as we said, very explosive thunderstorm development occurred along that frontal boundary by about lunchtime or so. And you can see how quickly these storms blossomed into strong thunderstorms there. Overshooting top there on this storm. And that's because the parcel accelerations, given the very steep lapse rates aloft and the ample instability that was in place, were very, very high. And so these parcels were rocketing upward. And these were very tall storms as well. Uh, be given the very strong instability in place. So um, these were these quickly became uh, severe given the explosive development as they moved toward the southwest along the frontal zone slash dry line boundary. And given the fact that there was so little development away from the boundaries, it was clear that the boundary was necessary uh, for thunderstorm formation on this day. Whereas some days it's, you know, you can see storms out in the open warm sector. On this particular day, the boundary was really helping to overcome such weak forcing uh, on the synoptic scale. So the first tornado of the day occurred near the town of Lorena uh, at about 1.21 p.m., produced F2 damage. And we had actually had a couple of other significant tornadoes prior to the Gerald tornado's formation. One was an EF3 near Moody, Texas. Uh, you can see there, very strong looking tornado from the video here. And we also had one that moved across Lake Belton and did some damage near Morgan's Point Resort there on the shores of Lake Belton. Um, you can see here, very strong looking tornado uh, as it moved across the lake there. So th those were the tornadoes that preceded the Gerald tornado. Uh, the Gerald tornado would, would occur um, between about 3 and 4 p.m. Central Standard Time on the 27th. So that's going to do it for the kind of meteorology portion of the event. Let's kind of dive into some of the nuances of this event. And the first one we'll start off with is the southwest motion. This case is well known for the fact that we had significant tor tornadoes with storms that moved toward the southwest. Of course, we often see storms in typical events that move from the southwest to the northeast. This one actually traveled from the northeast toward the southwest. So very unusual storm motion. Here. So let's go back to our radar imagery. We'll take a look at our zoomed out view here. And you can see the initial storms here that fire by about lunchtime are moving off toward the east with time. They are moving off toward the east with time. But eventually, as the these, uh, main storm kind of intensifies, it starts to move toward the southwest kind of along the boundary. And so we can break up storm motion into two different, different uh, components. The first one is translation. The second one is propagation. 
Now, translation is what you kind of typically, typically think is storm motion. When you see a warning you, it, and it says a storm is moving toward the northeast at 40 miles per hour, that's usually what we consider as translational speed. And translation of a storm occurs based on the mid and upper level winds aloft that are pushing the storm in a certain direction. So, as we recall, the, um, the overall flow in the mid and upper levels was kind of out of the west, as you can see here on this 500 millibar map, kind of sort of weak-ish, sort of westerly flow here across north central to central Texas. So that was helping to push these initial updrafts off toward the east with time. So that is what we would consider translation. These initial updrafts were translating off toward the east uh, at kind of a leisurely pace, if you will. But again, as we saw, as the storms intensified, they started to move along the boundary and sort of back build with time. And that is the propagation component of storm motion. Propagation is deals with the development or redevelopment of cells on a given flank of a storm. So it kind of gives the appearance, so to speak, of a storm moving in a certain direction. When it's actually just propagating, cells are kind of multiplying in a certain direction. And that, and hence the storm looks like it's moving in a certain direction. That's what we got here. Storms, an updraft started to continue to develop on the southwestern flank of the storm, kind of along the boundary. And we got what we called kind of back building. And back building, as described by Bluestein and Jane, 1985. I'll put the paper, that link to the that paper in the description below. But back building is when you have storms that propagate against the mean flow. So as we, as we discussed, the mean flow is kind of west to east, and the storms were propagating off toward the southwest in this case, kind of against the mean flow. So again, these updrafts were forming on the southwestern flanks of the ongoing supercell, you can see here on radar. And so that was the propagation mechanism that was much more governing the motion of these storms rather than the translational component of storm motion that would was trying to push these storms off toward the east given the westerly kind of mid and upper level flow in the atmosphere. And you can see here, we just continue to get these little updrafts to go on the southwestern flanks of these storms. Uh, and this was able to continue to propagate toward the southwest and back build with time, eventually forming kind of a cluster as it moved off uh, well to the south along the frontal zone slash dry line boundary. Now, as described in Bluestein and Jane 1985, this back building effect uh, often happens in environments of strong wind shear. And as we discussed, that was not the case with the Gerald uh, event. Um, instead, we had very weak flow aloft, very weak deep layer shear. So there had to be another um, mechanism that was describing why these storms were able to backbuild um, in this weak shear environment. And that was because of the zippering of the um, cold front and the dry line. So if we go back to 12Z here on our surface map, we had discussed that the cold front was slowly trying to overtake the dry line. And you can see with time that it eventually does and kind of the space between the two really decreases and it kind of zippers down toward the southwest. In other words, the cold front overtakes the dry line slowly as you, with a southern extent with time. It's kind of difficult to explain here. This is a figure from figure 25 from uh, Houston and Wilhelmson 2007 part one. I want you to look here at this figure on the right. Kind of is a cartoon that kind of describes this zippering effect a little bit better. You can see that with northern extent, the cold front overtakes the dry line. And it's kind of like closing a zipper on a duffel bag. That space between the two, that open space, closes off. And eventually the cold front would completely overtake the dry line here by you know late afternoon. You can see here at 21Z, we had gone from you know quite a bit of space between the cold front and dry line. Eventually that kind of zippers down with time. The cold front um, kind of overtakes the dry line and eventually by 21Z or so, we had had just one kind of composite front here, one cold front that stretched from Northeast Texas all the way into kind of the Del Rio vicinity there. So kind of that zippering effect was what was able to allow this back building propagation mechanism despite the weak shear in the environment. And you can even see here on radar, this fine line, this is our dry line right here. And this is our cold front. You can kind of see the fine line there. It'll come into view a little bit better. But as the cold front was overtaking the dry line with northern extent, we, we continue to get these updrafts to develop on the southwestern flank of this storm. And you can see down here, here's our cold front. Here's our dry line starting to overtake. Uh, the cold front was starting to overtake the dry line. And eventually they become one boundary. And then we get kind of explosive development 
uh, as that zippering effect was was taking place off toward the southwest there um, with time. So that was what allowed this um, sort of back building, even though the deep layer shear was fairly weak. So that kind of describes the southwest motion of the event. Now still, we have to describe how we got significant tornadoes from this event when this was clearly not a significant tornado type environment. So now let's focus in on the Gerald storm. The Gerald tornado first started as a small but pretty intense tornado near the town of Prairie Dell, produced some F1 damage near there, moved off toward the southwest, briefly lifted, and then came back down and quickly widened and intensified as it moved into the northwest portions of Gerald. This is some footage here of the tornado in its early rope stages as it was moving southwest near Prairie Dell. And then as we know, it eventually became a, you know, Pretty strong tornado, has some multi-vortex characteristics at times, uh, and then eventually widened into a very intense tornado uh, as it did F5 damage uh, in Gerald. So here's the kind of zoomed in view of the radar here. Unfortunately, the KGRK radar archive, which would, is right here, would be perfect uh, to analyze this storm with. Unfortunately, the radar archive for KGRK did not have data for this day, so I had to resort to using KEWX data, which is the Austin San Antonio radar, radar farther off to the south, but still gives us a pretty decent view here. A little bit of range folding in the velocity data that we'll have to deal with here, but nonetheless gives us a pretty decent view. So you can see the storm moving off toward the southwest, has some semblance of mesocyclone there near that uh, Lake Belton area as it produces EF3, uh, an F3 tornado there, moves off to the south, and the mesocyclone quickly uh, develops and intensifies as it moves to the southwest of Salado, then into Gerald before kind of fanning out uh, as it um, um, eventually dissipates to the kind of west uh, of the Gerald vicinity. So this was a, we still have to, you know, discuss how do we get an, an F5 tornado out of this? We have a southwest moving storm in a very weak shear environment. How does this happen? So I want to bring to your attention figure 18 uh, from the uh, Houston and Wilhelmson 2007 Part 1 paper. Again, the link to this will be in the description below. And there's a common misconception about the Gerald tornado, I think, that the um, tornado actually moved along the cold front, and the reason that these tornadoes happened were because of the, they tracked kind of along the cold front, you know, typical kind of boundary um, scenario, boundaries influenced tornadic event. And that was not 100% the case. These, as we talked about earlier, the supercells were able to uh, attain their rotation by efficiently stretching that, that spin into the vertical from that horizontal vorticity along the boundary, the cold front and the dry line. But the actual tornadoes occurred just off toward the east of the cold front slash dry line boundary. They actually occurred along a distorted sort of gust front that was emanating from this storm complex. So this is figure 18, again, from Houston and Wilhelmson 2007, part one. And this kind of um, outlines the different boundaries that we had in play. Here's our cold front boundary. Out in here, this dark line with the um, triangle, triangle figures on them. Here's our dry line boundary. Again, we talked about the zippering that was occurring here that was allowing new updrafts to form uh, where that cold front was overtaking the dry line. But then we have these outflow boundaries here. We, had, we have one here, heading off toward the west from the storm complex. And then we have one here that was moving, uh, heading off toward the south or southwest from the main storm. And these outflow boundaries, this gust front from this storm, was the main culprit in, in the tornado development of actually most of these tornadoes. Houston Wilhelmson found that um, a great majority of these tornadoes, at least these significant tornadoes, including the Moody tornado, the Lake Belton tornado, and the Gerald tornado occurred at this kind of cusp of the gust front right in here. You can see there's a little sort of kink in the main gust front right in here. And that is what those the most significant tornadoes of the event, including the Gerald tornado, occurred on, right on that cusp there. And first we have to determine how does this cusp form? Well, you can see here from the analysis, from the surface data here, the winds off toward the west or kind of northwest of the main sort of gust front were fairly strong, 10 to 15 knots here out of the north. Whereas we had southerly or south-southeasterly winds to the south of this gust front, um, and that was why this kink was forming. The strong shear across the gust front, across the boundary, was helping to create this sort of kink in the gust front. 
and the slightly stronger winds to the west of the cold front slash gust front here were helping to push this portion of the gust front a little bit farther to the south, a little bit more rapidly than the farther east portion of the gust front where uh, because of the winds in the open warm sector to the east of the boundary were a little bit on the weaker side. And the Gerald tornado actually formed along this gust front cusp. Let me take you to figure five, fig first figure three, from the Houston Wilhelmson 2007 part two paper. And first we'll take a look at the radar imagery from 2013Z here, um, figure C, 3C here. This is the velocity data at 0 0.5 degrees and then at 4.3 degrees here on the right from the KGRK radar. And we see here a pretty solid mid-level mesocyclone here associated with that gust front cusp right along there. You can see the white boundaries um, that sort of kink in the gust front right in there. And right along that was a, a fairly significant mid-level mesocyclone, low to mid-level mesocyclone um, that, was, uh, that existed right at that gust front cusp. Well, if we go to figure five here, this shows us that the gust front cusp played a significant role in the development of the Gerald tornado. So we start here on this figure on the left here, this first one, 2007, uh, 2007Z here, A, this top one. So this is a little bit difficult to follow, but these outlines here, these kind of transparent sort of gray and light gray sort of contours are the 30 dBZ and 50 dBZ reflectivity areas of this storm. So that's kind of basically the reflectivity um, that you'd see on radar. The um, black oval here is the location of that mesocyclone that we talked about from figure three. And you can see where the different boundaries are laid out here. Here's our gust front kink right here. Here's that little mesocyclone associated with that kink. So we have our storm, our ongoing storm moving off toward the south. Here, that location of the, the solid white circle is our prairie del tornado moving down kind of the, the distorted gust front here. And then we have an updraft that goes up right up here. You can see this little outline of reflectivity go up right, co-located with this ongoing mesocyclone at that gust front cusp. And it's kind of difficult to see here on radar. Again, this is from KEWX, much farther to the south. I wish we had KGRK radar for this. You can't really see the outflow boundary from KEWX. It's kind of hidden here. But what ha actually happened, what actually um, initiated the Gerald tornado was we had our supercell moving south, but we had new storms start to initiate on the southwestern flank here and interact with that gust front cusp or kink there and kind of stretch that mesocyclone into the vertical. And that is how we got tornado formation uh, with that eventually became the Gerald F5. So you might be thinking, well, this is not typical, you know, supercell tornado formation. And you're right. This had very significant characteristics from non-supercell or landspout tornado characteristics. This is figure 20 from Wakimoto and Wilson, 1989, where they talk about the formation of non-supercell tornadoes. And we've talked about this before. All you need for a landspout tornado to form is a little bit of vorticity or spin at the surface, and you need an updraft co-located above that vorticity. And then when you have steep lapse rates, strong instability in the low levels, that will stretch that vorticity into the vertical, and you'll get a landspout or non-supercell tornado. And the Gerald case actually had a very significant component of non-supercell tornado, tornado formation here. We had this mesocyclone here. You can kind of see it right in here on, the, on this KEWX radar. We can better see it from our... Um, Houston and Wilhelmson paper here. Here's our low-level mesocyclone right in here. And we had an updraft go up on the flank, the southwestern flank of that storm, and, and um, interact with that mesocyclone and stretch that into the vertical, given the very strong low-level instability in place. And you can see here on the satellite view, as we go on with time, you can see our ongoing storm here. And you can actually kind of see some updrafts start to go up on the southwestern flank of that storm, uh, of the ongoing sort of uh, storm as we approach the time of tornado genesis for the Gerald and Prairie Dell tornadoes. So very interesting case here that this was, again, not along the actual cold front itself. We had this gust front to blame for these tornadoes. You can see just out to the east, our mesocyclone there, just off toward the east, and eventually our Gerald tornado um, formed because of that co-location of an updraft with the gust front cusp mesocyclone. And that's how we got the Gerald tornado. So a very interesting, very unique case. Very Not a case that comes around a lot. A lot. This was a very nuanced case and a, a case that, that required all of these elements to come together for such a significant tornado to happen. And of course, when you have you know this much instability, this much low-level instability as well, 
with ample spin already existing from that low-level mesocyclone there at the gust front cusp. That's going to be stretched very, very efficiently into the vertical. You're going to get a tornado, kind of a hybrid non-supercell and supercell tornado um, to form from that um, environment. And of course, the supercell would continue to move off toward the southwest and kind of merge with that updraft. We already had kind of uh, that supercell mesocyclone ongoing and kind of just a perfect storm happened to allow that to continue and strengthen as it moved into the northwestern portion of Gerald doing F5 damage. And we can com kind of compare this gust front kink here, this gust front cusp, to kind of a classic sort of RFD um, interface, an interface between the RFD and the forward flank downdraft on a classic supercell. This is a diagram I've shown before. This is Lemon and Doswell 1979. This is our schematic diagram of a typical tornadic supercell. We have our RFD here. We have our um, forward flank downdraft gust front here. And right at the interface of those two, right at the kink or cusp of those two is where we often see tornado formation. And you can see this schematic looks very similar to what we saw from our situation here. Even though this was, this was not a classic rear flank downdraft, this was just the gust front being kind of distorted by the strong shear across it. That is how we got something to kind of get that right at that interface there between that right at that cusp is right where we see the tornado formation that looks very, very similar to our typical schematic of a classic tornadic supercell there. So very interesting case, very one of a kind case there um, as far as formation goes. We don't often see you know, violent tornadoes come from sort of this sort of non-supercell tornado process, but that's exactly what happened here. Once again, low-level mesocyclone was able to get stretched into the vertical given very strong low-level instability as we had a new updraft take place right overhead and stretch that into the vertical, and that's how we got our Gerald tornado to form. So very interesting case, and again, a misnomer that this that the tornadoes tracked along the cold front. They actually didn't. It was actually most of, most of these significant tornadoes occurred along this gust front cusp. And given such strong low-level instability and such and a, an already strong mesocyclone there, no wonder we had a pretty significant tornado, even if this was you know a solely non-supercell um, type tornado, this would have been a pretty strong one given such strong uh, you know, parameters already in place. Now, one other issue that we have here is the um, possibility of storm mergers impacting the um, supercell. So as we go through the radar here, you can, as we talked about before, we continued to get these little blips to fire on the southwestern flank of the storm, and they would kind of merge with the ongoing supercell here. And the question is, did these mergers have anything to do with the overall um, progression of the tornado? Well, right at about 2037Z is when we had a storm merger take place. And, and by this point, the Prairie Dell slash Gerald tornado was already in progress here. We already had a pretty strong tornado in progress here. You can see the mesocyclone there, the, the tornado vortex signature approaching Gerald. So we already had a tornado ongoing here, and there's not much evidence to support that, that mergers actually initiated these tornadoes. We talked about the initiation process ad nauseum there just a few minutes ago. But what may have actually happened, and you can see what happens here, we get these updrafts to form, southwestern flank, right, kind of over Gerald. And what happens is we go on with time, we kind of see a continuation, a strengthening of these kind of updrafts out ahead of the storm. And we eventually get a merger to take place here at about 2037Z, right in the forward flank region of the storm. You can see this kind of um, echo right there, our previous kind of updraft that formed on the southwest flank, moved kind of into the forward flank region right there. Now, again, the tornado was already ongoing, but it was at this point that eyewitness accounts um, state that the um, Gerald tornado started to widen um, right around this time. So there's some evidence that this um, actually may, this merger may have um, allowed the tornado to increase in intensity. And we've talked about this before. You can get co constructive or destructive interference when you have a storm merger. If, when you have destructive interference, oftentimes that will kill the storm, kill the tornado pot potential with the storm. And when you have constructive interference, and you know, just from experience, oftentimes when you have these little showers go up into the kind of the forward flank region of the storm, that can kind of intensify the storm and increase the tornado potential, or perhaps in this case, uh, in, uh, intensify the ongoing tornado uh, into a monster as we saw here. So there's some evidence that this merger may have taken place and may have um, helped out, helped to increase the intensity of the Gerald tornado. Again, there's not a whole lot of, of um, definitive evidence to say so, but very interesting that we did have a merger ongoing at this time right before 
we saw the strongest damage occur there on the northwest side of Gerald. So that's going to pretty much wrap things up here again. Such an interesting, interesting case uh, was this Gerald case. Uh, you know, again, it's kind of the um, golden standard for mesoscale accidents, if you will, um, in kind of storm chasing history. Um, once again, it was a, an environment that did not favor tornadic supercells. Very strong instability, but not a whole lot of wind shear to speak of. So, you know, at most we thought this was going to be a, um, you know, large hail damaging wind type day with maybe a tornado or two, brief tornado or two along the boundaries. And it was those boundaries that definitely helped out. Again, we needed the, the cold front and the dry line to help um, allow the storms that fired near that dry line low to attain low level rotation. And given, and that low level rotation, that spin along the boundary was stretched so efficiently into the vertical because we had such strong low level instability. So the storms were able to become supercells in the vicinity of that boundary, but we still needed something to allow for significant tornadoes to happen. And it was a very, very nuanced, very unique set of circum circumstances that happened um, to um, allow such a series of significant to violent tornadoes to occur. And it was this, this gust front, and how it was kind of oriented perfectly. We've talked about this before. To get these violent tornadoes, you need everything to be perfect. And this gust front kind of kink here, the orientation was just perfect enough um, with that kind of mesocyclone already located at that gust front cusp with an, a perfectly timed updraft to go to uh, get co-located with that mesocyclone to stretch it into the vertical and become a tornado, kind of merge with the main supercell and do quite a bit of damage there. Um, and you know now it's kind of one of the, the most infamous cases in storm chasing history or meteorological history um, from you know a setup that, that wasn't supposed to be that way. Uh, from the get-go. So hope you learned something from this case study. I'll be back with more case studies here in the near future, uh, but this one was definitely an interesting one that I wanted to share with you all um, before um, too long. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.